Joshua, as we come to Joshua, Joshua is right after the first five books of the Bible, the Septuagint, the Law of Moses. And what has happened is the children of Israel were delivered out of bondage. God used Moses to be their deliverer. He delivers them out of bondage in Egypt, and they're headed to the land of promise. And if you'll remember how God brought them out, it was through the Passover. He brought plagues upon Egypt. The last one was you had to take the blood of the lamb in the shape of a cross and put it on, your, on the doorpost of your home. And everybody who did that, the angel of death passed over. And if you didn't do that, the oldest person in the home would die. And what happened was, as we know, you got to take the blood of the Lamb. They didn't even understand the shape of a cross at that time. But guys, that was a picture of Jesus Christ. Because guys, we're only saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And it's not enough to believe that there's blood of the Lamb. It's not enough to believe that He's the Lamb of God. It's not even enough to believe that He died on the cross. Just like the children of Israel had to apply the blood to the doorpost, we have to apply the blood of Christ to our own lives by repenting and confessing our sin and our need for a Savior. So they've been delivered out of bondage. They crossed over the Red Sea. They're headed to the land of promise. And as you know, if you've been here, that 11-day journey turned into a 40-year death march. Why? Because when they got to the land of promise, even though God said there was going to be giants in the land and He would give them victory in the land, they wimped out. They didn't trust the Word of God. Ten spies came back and said, there's giants in there. They'll destroy us. And so what happens instead? They said, we're not going to go in. And so that entire generation spends 40 years in the wilderness, and they all, that entire generation of 20 years of age and above all dies in the wilderness because they did not step out in faith and obey God. So now we come to Joshua, and now they're about to enter into the land. Moses had to pass on the ministry to Joshua. Now Joshua is now the one taking the place of the mo- one of the most irreplaceable men ever, which is proof that God doesn't need us, we need Him. Amen? And all people can be replaced even though he was the one that gave them the law, he's the one that had been on Mount Sinai, he had the one who, who had, you know, had caught a glimpse of the glory of God and was glowing in the dark and coming down and speaking to the people. Now it's been handed off to Joshua. And in the first two chapters of Joshua, we saw that Joshua heard from the Lord, and when he heard the command of the Lord, he came and told the people, we're going into the land of promise. He didn't say we're going to think about it, he didn't say we're going to vote on it, we're going in. But if you were here last week, he sent two guys into the land who thought they were going in to be spies, but they really went in to be witnesses. And remember how they had a divine appointment with a woman by the name of Rahab. So they went into the land of Jericho, this mighty huge fortress. Remember, the children of Israel really don't have an army. They have God. They don't have weapons. They don't have chariots. They certainly don't have a fortress. And they're going to go into a land that's filled with giants, with fortresses, with weapons. And they're going to have to trust God. And sometimes in our lives, you look at situations in our life and they seem overwhelming. You may look at your life and you may see things that to you are, I'll never get over this. I'll never get past this. I'll never be able to overcome these circumstances in my life because we're looking at them from the perspective of the spies who went in the first time. They see the greatness of the land instead of the greatness of our God. Amen. I was sharing earlier, I had three sons, all addicted to heroin. As you guys know, when I came home after being in a coma and being away from my family, and you know what? Sometimes you look at that circumstance and you say, that'll never be fixed. So, so God can, but God, our God is greater than any addiction, amen? Our God is greater than any trial, any difficulty, any health issue, anything we can go through in life. Our God is greater still, amen? So we can thank God for that, and we can praise Him for that, and we can see. So they go into the land, and there they meet Rahab, and Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a Gentile woman. Rahab was an idol worshiper. And yet, she had heard about the God of Israel. And she told the two witnesses who had come into the land, she said, you know what? Everybody in here is scared to death of you guys. Now, can you imagine if you go in and they've got a huge fortress and someone tells you, well, we have no weapons and we really don't have an army that much and we really don't have any, you know, we don't have any chariots and you've got chariots and you've got a fort, but we're afraid of you. And why were they afraid? Because they had heard that the God of Israel had parted the Red Sea 40 years earlier. They had heard that they had had victory over these mighty armies outside of the land of promise. Sihon and Og, these great kings, have been defeated. So they said, everybody's up here, and we're in this fortress, but we're scared to death of you. Our our hearts are melting like wax. And Rahab said to the two witnesses, can, can, you, can you remember my family when you guys come back? I mean, I'll hide you from these people here. They're looking for you. I'll hide you. But just remember my family when you come back. 
And if you remember what, what they told Rahab to do, they said, take a red cord, like a red rope, and hang it out of your window. And if you hang it out of your window, if you hold that red rope out of your window, then when they come into the land to destroy it, you'll be protected, you and everybody in your household. If you guys want to take, if anybody wants to head over to children's ministry, they're ready for you guys. You can do that. So what's awesome about that picture is that in the land of Egypt, if they painted the doorposts red on each side, what happened? They were delivered from sure judgment. And now the same thing was happening. She was going to hang a red cord out of her window. And when they came up, their windows were painted, her window was painted red because she was a prostitute. And when the cord hung out, it looked like a cross. And because of that, if she, had do, if she does that, she's going to have victory. Now, when they come back to Joshua, the two spies, they say, we went in there and guess what? They're scared to death of us. Their hearts are melting like wax. Let's go get them. So that brings us to Joshua chapter 3. And now we're going to see them entering into the land. If you've got your outline, I titled it Stepping Out in Faith. Stepping Out in Faith. It's been said, a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And God has called us to not only believe in Him, but have enough of a belief in Him that it produces an action in our lives. Guys, I can say that I believe that that chair will hold me up. But if I never sit down in it, I really don't have proof. I can say that I believe God is faithful, but if I don't step out in faith, if I don't step out and you know, put my foot in the water before it parts, how do I know if God is really faithful? So we're going to see in stepping out in faith tonight, as they're getting ready, they're going to be encamped at the bank of the river, the Jordan River, that 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. Now they're back at the Jordan. They're about to go into the land of promise, all that God has for them. And they know on the other side, they've been warned by Moses, there's going to be giants there. There's going to be idols there. There's going to be difficulty there. And guys, just because we obey God and we step out in faith doesn't mean we won't face difficulty. There's going to be difficulty there, but the difference is we won't be alone. Amen? So we're going to see, stepping out in faith first, we're going to see words of faith. And he's going to give instructions, Joshua is, by the power of the Holy Spirit, of how to uh, have a faithful walk. And these are six practical things for everyone in the room tonight and how to have a more faithful walk with God. First, begin your day with the Lord. We'll get into these more details as we go through them. But you know what? If you begin your day with the Lord, the day is going to go a lot better. Can we say amen to that? Amen. If you spend time in His presence, you spend time in prayer, you get in your car, you got a different perspective, you look for opportunities to share your faith, it just changes the perspective of the whole day. David began his day with the Lord. Hezekiah began his day with the Lord. Daniel began his day with the Lord. Jesus, who's Almighty God in human flesh, began the day, his day with the Father. How much more should we begin our day with the Lord? Number two, pursue God's presence. You know, everybody pursues something. What are you chasing after? Is it money? Is it a career? Is it, what is it? What's the thing you're pursuing in your heart? Let me tell you right now, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will take care of itself. Amen? Pursue God above everything else. Desire His presence. Number three, hold the Lord in a place of reverence and godly fear. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The reason that our country is in the shape it's in, our world is in the shape it's in, is not enough fear of God. Can we say amen to that? Amen. His name is used more as a curse word than a word of adoration and worship. Because we live in a place where people don't fear God. Fourthly, separate yourself from the world and unto the Lord. Too often we get into a mess because we're trying too much to be like the very world that we need to be ministering to, not mimicking. Amen? We don't need to be like the world. We're different than the world. We're set apart from the world. Today I had a, most of you guys don't have a full-time job. And I'm at a sales meeting today. And we were having lunch and, and I'm the only believer at the table. And when people are talking about their priorities and the passions, I love these guys. I pray for them. I have a burden for them. I want to see them saved. But we just have different priorities of life. We have different things that we reflect on. We have a different place where we put our hope and our joy and our peace. Guys, we're to be in the world but not of the world. We're to minister to the world but have no fellowship with it. Amen. Finally, number five there, uh, trust God's word. Is God's word true? Yes. 100%. It's challenged by a lost and a dying world. The, those who challenge it keep changing their mind. The Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then finally, humble yourself. 
You know, we live in a world that's very filled with pride and we all struggle with it. Can we say amen to that? I'm always on my mind. How about you? My three favorite people, me, myself, and I. Amen? And we always think about ourselves. How does this affect me? And my feelings got hurt. And it's all about it. But you know what? The Bible says we're to deny ourselves. Take up the cross and follow him. We'll see that in tonight's text. And then not only is it words of faith we're going to see delivered by Joshua, but we're going to see the walk of faith. It's one thing to say that I trust God, and it's another thing to live like it. So let's get there, begin there in Joshua chapter 3. We're going to begin there in verse 1, beginning by looking at words of faith, instructions for a faithful walk. And here is Joshua is instructing them. He's going to really be instructing us as well. Look what it says in verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them, that is all who had not known any of the wars of Canaan. I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm like, Lord help. This is what happens when you wear glasses. I'm like, that's not what I studied. I'm in trouble. That was Judges 3. It starts with a J at least. All right. Verse 1. Then Joshua rose early in the morning And they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So the first thing we see is Joshua raises up early in the morning. He knows the day has got a heavy task in front of them. What is going to happen today, or or at least soon, is they're going to cross over that Jordan River. The one that 40 years earlier, everyone went out. This is the thing they've been looking forward to. And the day has finally come. They're actually going to be on the bank for three days. But they're going to go head over to the bank. They're going to be prepared to go in. And Joshua knew with the heavy trial in front of him, he needed to spend time with the Lord first. Can we say amen to that? Guys, if we try to do things on our own strength, we're going to fail miserably. I'm going to just do my best. I'm committing never to do that again. And then what happens? We do it again. Because if we're in our own strength, we cannot overcome anything. But our God is greater than any trial, any difficulty, any fortress, any enemy, any army, any, any uh, addiction, any struggle in our life. God's greater. And He can give us victory over it. But we need to spend time in His presence. We can't ignore God and then be bummed when God doesn't minister to us or God doesn't strengthen us. And so here, Joshua, knowing what's in front of them, before he does anything else, before he addresses the people, before he begins his day, he goes and gets away with the Lord. Notice that, for, you'll see it throughout the Bible, if you're going to spend time with the Lord, sometimes that means you're going to have to rise early. Amen. Amen? Here's more proof that we're selfish. We don't like to get up early. Can anybody say amen to that? How many of you have the demon of the snooze alarm problem? Hit, give me seven more minutes, you know. And we got this reality, and we hit that thing five times, and we got to spend a half an hour with the Lord. The reality is, let's begin our day with the Lord. Joshua stops and does everything he's doing. He says, I'm going to start off with hanging out with God. You know where he learned that? Watching Moses. Amen? He was at the foot of the mountain when Moses went up to the top of the mountain. He knew that... The strength and the power and the faith that Moses had came from his intimate walk with God. So he was going to mimic that and spend time with the Lord himself. Now notice what he does. They set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. So they go out to the Jordan River, and there, I want to give you the picture. Now I've been to the Jordan River in Israel, and the river in the Jordan today is nothing like it was back then. Back then, it was almost a mile across. So they're going to come to this river. Now remember, the children of Israel is two to three million people. This isn't four friends on a camp out taking a swim. This is two to three. There's women and children. And, and, uh, you know, and people are all there. And here they are. And, you know, oh, man, we're going to cross. How are we going to get two to three million people across this river and knowing that when we get to the other side, there's giants waiting for us? Maybe they'll ambush us when we get there. How do we know we're even going to get across? One person who's a good swimmer, swimming a mile, I could do that. Two to three million people with women and children. Oh man, that's a deal. So guess what's going to happen? They're going to camp out on the bank of the river and be staring at the obstacles we're going to see for three days. And most people, if you stare at an obstacle long enough, it just makes you more afraid. 
Amen? Oh man, look at that. Oh man, I got that test coming up. Oh no, what am I going to do? And we just get overwhelmed. But you know what? God allows us to see the obstacle in front of us so that we will see the greatness of our God when He brings us through it. Amen? God, our obstacles are only great if our God is small. So He brings them to the bank of the Jordan River. After spending the morning with the Lord, He's been strengthened. He's been refreshed by spending time with God. And so he arose early in the morning and was eager. He began his day with the Lord, and they walked about seven miles from the Acacia Grove to the Jordan, and all the children of Israel lodged there before they crossed over. It says there at the end of verse 1. So two to three million men and women and children encamped in the banks of the Jordan. Imagine how big the camp would be for two to three million people. It's going for miles. There's all these people, and there's the river. There's the Jordan they've been talking about. An entire generation has died. It's in front of them. And then on the other side, giants are waiting for them. No doubt they could be anxious. They could be fearful. They could be worried. And praise God that God gave them a leader like Joshua. Remember, Joshua's name is Yahshua, which is Jesus. Amen? We talked about the fact that Moses couldn't bring them into the land. Only Joshua or Jesus could because Moses is a picture of the law. The law can't save you. Only Jesus can. Verse 2. So it was, after three days, the officers went through the camp. So as the nation awaited by this rushing river... Uh, and swollen Jordan River from the spring rains and melting snow from Mount Hermon. Again, they must have wondered, how are we going to get across? I wonder what Joshua's plan is. Are we going to build a bridge over the top? Is he going to build a big boat and just take us over a few at a time? How are we going to get across? Now, has the Lord told them how they're going to get across yet? What's the answer? No. But God told them to go, so he went. And too often, we don't want to go unless God lays out the whole plan. Amen? Well, I want you to go plan a church. Well, tell me where we're going to meet and how many people are going to show up and how are we going to pay for this thing? And who's going to be, you know, and people are like, well, you want me to cross the river? Well, I mean, you better build up some banks. You better dry up the water first. You better get me some boots to go across. And you better make sure there's a Starbucks halfway across because I'm going to get tired, you know. And there's this mentality that we have. Well, God, I'll go, but, you know, you better lay out the plan because I'm not, you know. And they told Joshua, go to the river. He doesn't even know. And he's the guy leading them. He doesn't know how they're going to get across. Guys, we don't have to know. We just have to trust that God knows. Amen. Amen? God is faithful. God knows. God knows exactly what he's doing. We can trust him. I don't need to know. I just need to trust in the one who does. And I'm so thankful for that. How about you? How many of you guys, your life went exactly the way you thought it was going to? If your hand's up, you're a liar. Amen? No, no, no. I'm going to do this. I'm going to meet this person. And then I'm going to get married. And then I'm going to have kids. And then this is going to happen. This job. I'm going to, and then I'm going to live here. None of us. Our lives take turns that we don't expect. I don't think Eric thought he was going to be living in Southern California from Wisconsin. Amen? I mean, we don't know where we're going. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. God knew. God knows. God has us right where he wants us. God's going to use us for his glory if we will let him. So here they are. They're all mounted up. I wonder how we're going to get across. What are we going to do? So the first thing we saw, the first point there was to begin your day with the Lord. And now we need to pursue God's presence. Because guys, when we don't know the answer, we need to go to the one who does. Amen? Moments like this, talk of the wonderful land, the seemingly impossible blocking their way, having no idea how they're going to cross, three days of having to meditate on that, the only way you're going to find the answer is to turn to the Lord. Guys, don't follow your emotions. Trust the Word of God. How many of you guys have your emotions have ever lied to you before? But I feel. But I just think it's right because that's how I feel. My feelings lie to me all the time. How about you? The Bible says your flesh will never be satisfied and your feelings sometimes will be attracted to the very things that will destroy you. So instead of being overwhelmed by their fear of the river and not knowing how they're going to get across, they've got to trust God. How do they do that? Look at verse 3. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. The ark of the covenant, if you're not 
familiar with the ark. Maybe you're not. It's not Noah's ark. It's not a boat. It's a box. Okay? Noah's ark was a, you know, a football, you know, football field, a couple of field, football field long boat. The ark of the covenant was a box. It was a box that was covered in gold, plated in gold. It had a seat on the top of it. You opened it up, and inside of it was the manna, which is a picture of, you know, a reminder of their wandering in the wilderness, but also that Jesus is the bread of life. Aaron's rod, he was the high priest. It was inside there. And also the, the Ten Commandments, remembering the law. But covering all of that is the mercy seat. And what's interesting is you have the angels on each end of it, on the mercy seat, with their wings touching. And the ark was inside the tabernacle and ladle the temple, and it was in the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could go in on the Day of Atonement and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And it was to remind them that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. But what's awesome is it's also a picture of the resurrection of Christ, because when Jesus rose from the dead and they entered into the tomb, what did they see? An angel at the foot and an angel at the head with blood in the middle. It was all pointing to Jesus. It always was. And so he says to them, they don't, know, they don't know what the plan is. Now he's going to tell them the plan, and it's not going to sound like much of a plan. When the guys with the box walk across, walk behind them. We got surfboards. We got a boat. No. When the guys with the box walk across, follow them. When the presence of God is leading the way, follow him. Amen. The ark was God's presence. And guys, we don't pursue ideas or thoughts. We pursue the Lord. We make God the priority. God's the passion. And when you're seeking after God, remember when they were in the wilderness, every morning they would wake up, there was a pillar of a cloud and a pillar of fire, depending on if it was day or night. And what they would do is when they would wake up from their tents, the first thing to do is look up to see if the cloud had moved. Because when the cloud moved, they had to put up their tents and move to wherever it was as they followed the Lord through the wilderness for 40 years, God's presence. So now the same thing is true. The ark's going to go through, and when you see it go, get in line and walk in behind them. Uh, that still doesn't sound like much of an answer to me. I, 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 I don't know how to swim. You think there's some people out of the two to three million didn't know how to swim? Do you think there's some of them that were a little older and had a hard time getting around? Maybe a few folks with some canes, and this water's rushing by. I, I understand what you're telling me to do. I'm not so sure I know that I can do it. But again, we've got to trust in the promises of God. Point number two there in a faithful walk with the Lord is pursue God's presence. No longer led by the crowd, now they're going to be led by the presence of God in the ark. You know, Joshua didn't command, uh, follow the engineers, because they're going to build a bridge. Follow the boat makers, they're going to make boats. You know, follow the ditch diggers, they're going to dig a ditch and then, uh, you know, put up a wall so you can walk through. No, it said follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. Trust God. When you see God moving, go for it. Look what it says there. When you see from your place and go after it. You know what, do we need to go for it for God or what? Amen? I mean, we go for it for stuff, everything else in this world. When are we going to get out of our comfort zone and go for it for God? When are we going to get to the place where we, we get past being uncomfortable, get past the difficulties of, oh, people are watching me, or people are looking, or I don't know how it's going to go. Just when you see God moving, find out where God's moving and get involved there. Not pursuing a gift, not pursuing a, an experience or an emotional high, but pursuing God's presence. Too often we live in a world right now where everybody's looking for their flesh to feel good. Oh, that makes me feel good. I'll do that. A lot of times, you know, the Bible tells us our flesh will never be satisfied. Can we say amen to that? You say, oh, if I just do this once, I won't have to do it anymore. And you do, then you've got to do it more. And then your flesh is never happy. It's never enough money, never enough women, never enough careers, never enough, you know, whatever. Drugs, alcohol, whatever. Whatever you're pursuing, no, there's nothing that will satisfy. There's a God-shaped vacuum that only He can fill and nothing else can fill that hole. Amen? And so, when you see God moving, follow Him. So point number two there. In words of faith, instructions for a faithful lock, begin your day with the Lord. And number two, pursue God's presence. Number three, hold the Lord in a place of reverence and godly fear. Now watch what it says there in verse four. Yet you shall make a, you shall, there shall be a space between you and it, 
about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. There is going to be a space between the ark and them. A cubit was not a definite amount of space. It was usually whoever the ruler was, the distance between his elbow and his fingertip. I guess if you're buying a house by the square foot, you'd go get Goliath to be your cubit, right? Go get the biggest guy you could find. But what happens is, so let's just say it's about a foot and a half. 2,000 cubits is 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet is more than half a mile. So what he's saying is, look, it's a mile across roughly this river. Wait till they're all more than halfway across and then follow them. Get behind them. Now, why would the Lord tell them, go after it, follow me, but don't follow me too closely? Well, here's the point. We follow God, we don't push God. Amen? We don't push God, we don't direct God, we don't get right on us and say, you know, God, you need to do this. We don't command God, we don't direct God, we obey God. Amen? And we keep our eyes on Him, and when He's out in front of us, we follow Him, but at the same time, while we follow Him, we show Him reverence. Amen? Remember what would happen later, you know, if somebody opened up the mercy seat, what happened to them? What happened? They would die. Somebody, they were carrying the ark on poles. They didn't even touch it. If they touched it, it was a presence of God. They would die. So he's saying, look, follow me, but have reverence for me. Honor me. And so he says, look, they're going to be a half a mile out, and when you see them out in the middle of the water, you, get, you step out and get in the water behind them. You don't push God, you follow God. You trust God. He's a faithful God. Keep your eyes on him, but have a holy reverence for him. So the ark is out in front, leading the way. Again, the Lord leads us. We don't lead him. Uh, be careful when you pray, don't make commands of God. Amen? God, you need to do this. God doesn't need to do anything. We need him. Amen? We don't tell, aren't you glad that God doesn't just listen to everything everybody tells him to do? What a train wreck the world would be. Amen? No, we follow him, and we follow him with reverence. And we treat him with honor that is due his name. And so keep your eyes on him. And also make sure that they kept their eyes. He's in a distance, but I'm going to keep my eyes. And I'm going to follow him. I'm going to be faithful. Israel is going to accomplish this impossible task as they set their eyes on God's presence and follow him with a heart of reverence and holy fear. So, so point number three of a faithful walk Hold the Lord in a place of reverence and godly fear. Verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The word sanctify means to consecrate or set yourself apart unto the Lord. Wash yourselves, wash your garments, separate themselves from all the worldly things. Again, make spiritual, not, not military preparation. Look, they're getting ready to go walk into a land filled with giants. He didn't say, go back and do some training with your, you know, with your spears, if they even had any. Go back and train up with your swords. Didn't do that. He says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go spend time with the Lord. And I want you to set yourself apart unto Him. And I want you to spend time in His presence in preparation for watching what God is about to do. Guys, if we want to be used mildly by God, we have to spend time in the presence of God. Amen? I can't give what I haven't received. Amen? If I don't hear from Him, if I don't spend time in His presence, if I don't spend time talking to the Lord, hearing from His Word, praising His name, how in the world am I going to minister to anybody else? And that's why the world is in the mess that it's in, is people are listening to people that are just giving ungodly counsel from their own hearts. Guys, they were emptying themselves of themselves and being filled instead with God's perfect will and plan. Being less of me and more of him. John the Baptist would say, right? I must decrease that he might increase. There's only room for one person on the throne of your life. It's either the Lord or it's you. And if you're on the throne, you know it. And how's that working out for you? Amen? So step number four to a more faithful walk, separate yourself from the world and unto the Lord. He said, go consecrate yourselves, go sanctify yourselves. I also love Joshua's confidence. Tomorrow, it's going to happen. 
Not a week from Friday, not in six months, tomorrow. We're going to see the hand of God tomorrow. That's called faith. Amen? It's not seeing and then believing. It's believing and then seeing. God is greater. God's going to get us across. I just still don't know how. I just know when the ark goes, we follow. How are we going to get people across this rushing river? I have no idea. I just know God said he would, so I trust him. I looked at my bank account. I have no idea how God's going to provide, but I know that he will because he's faithful. I've got this, I don't know how I'm, God's going to give me victory over this struggle in my life, but God said he can't. And what? I trust him. Guys, need to learn to trust God even when we don't understand. The next point is trust God's word. Look at verse 6. Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. It's easy just to read that, but he went to them. It's hard enough getting across the river when you're walking or trying to swim. How about carrying a big, heavy, golden box that if it falls over and touches you, will kill you? How's that working out? Wait a minute, you want me to get in first? Can I see what someone else does? We don't even know how deep it is. Send someone else, send a tall guy out first. Let's see how deep it is. Send somebody else. No, he said, you guys are going first. You're the spiritual leaders here, the Levites. Grab a hold of the ark. By the way, don't let that thing tip over, you're toast. And walk out there carrying this big heavy ark with poles across a rushing river and trust God because he said, if you will do that, he will bring you to the other side. Now, it's one thing to say, I trust God, and it's another thing to act like it. You've all probably heard the illustration. It's a true story. A guy would, you know, Niagara Falls, he would walk across a tightrope over Niagara Falls, back and forth. And there's a crowd watching, and they're all cheering for him. Yeah. And they're like, you think I can do it, you know, with a wheelbarrow? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we all believe it, yeah. And he pulls a wheelbarrow out, and he goes, you all believe it, we believe it. He's like, okay, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> oh, not so much. It's easy to believe he can get over the wheelbarrow with you in it, but you're not putting me in the wheelbarrow. You know, faith is when you say, put me in. I trust that you'll get across to the other side and back on a raw tightrope with me in a wheelbarrow. Guys, he commands them to step out by faith. It's one thing to say we believe it, and it's another thing to act like it. Faith is not to be a passive feeling, but an active force. Didn't have any of the details yet, but he's still faithful to deliver God's word because he knew God was faithful. Abraham believed God and went out not knowing where he was going. And look what God did. Moses believed God and defied the gods of Egypt and led the Jewish people to freedom. Gideon believed God and led a small band of Jews to defeat the huge Midianite army. Nice. God's desire is that we would step out in faith, that we would be unashamed of the gospel of Christ, and that we would trust Him even when we don't fully understand. People think because I'm a pastor, like I have every Bible answer that there is. I get calls, well, you're a pastor. And they'll tell me, oh, you know in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 9, you know what that says, right? No. I have not memorized the Bible. Contrary to what most people might believe, I have not memorized the Bible. And there's an expectation that you know everything. Guys, I don't know everything, but here's what I do know. I know that God is faithful. I know that God is in control. I know that he loves me. I know that I can trust him. And you know what? I'm going to follow him with my whole heart. That's what I know. Amen? Amen? And sometimes, well, I, well, doesn't it bother you that you don't know? No, it would bother me if I knew everything, because then that would mean God's not that smart. Because I'm not that smart. I'm glad that God is so much greater than I can possibly grasp. Can you say amen to that? But I trust Him. My hope's in Him. My hope's not in the economy. It's not in my bank account. It's not in my strength. It's in the power of Almighty God. And He's saying, look, trust God. Trust His Word. Trust His commands. Believe Him. And believe Him enough, not just to say, I believe it, but to have actions that prove you believe it. Look at how verse 7 and 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day... 
I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Joshua is going to do the miraculous the same way Moses did. Moses was able to free, by the grace of God, he was just a tool in the hand of the Master, Three million people have been in bondage for over 400 years. How did he do that? He trusted God when it didn't make sense. Remember, Moses was going back to his hometown. Moses was standing in front of his own relatives. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. Remember that? And he had to run for his life, and they were looking for him for a long time. So now he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert as a shepherd, having no idea that God was going to use him in such a powerful way. But when he went back, he went back with a stick and the power of God. Amen? The greatest army in the world. Hey, uh, Jack, I want you to go fight ISIS. Take your cane with you. You're going to need that. We're going to have a whole army of ISIS. Go get them, Jack. I'm, 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 I wouldn't bet against Jack. I don't know about you. But the reality is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Is that not what Moses did? He had a staff, a stick. And he walked in there and said, God said, let the people go. These are all people that could kill him on sight. Guys, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Our God is greater than our circumstances. And we need to have faith, and we need to trust in the Lord, trust in his word. But notice, he lets them know. I'm going to let them know that I'm speaking through you, Joshua, that I've got my hand upon you. You're going to command the priests, and you're going to tell them to go into the water. It says there in verse 9, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here. And hear the words of the Lord your God. Now, I love this. Joshua speaks to God, hears from God. And the first thing he does is turn around and tell it to everyone else. Do you know that that's what we're called to do? Why do we study the Bible? We study it so it'll transform us, but we also study it so we can tell others. Amen? This is the antidote to the death serum of sin. Amen? If you didn't know it, one out of every one person dies. Amen? Did you my uncle's funeral a week and a half ago? And now I'm going to my nephew's wedding. There it is, life, right? But here's the reality. We're all going to die. We're all going to stand before Almighty God one day. And when we do, the only thing that will matter is what have you done with God's Son? Nothing else will matter. Who are you in Christ? What kind of relationship do you have with the Lord? And the only way we can have faith is to know the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, God, Romans 10, 17. So if you want to have a greater faith, spend more time in the Word of God. Well, I don't have much faith. How much time are you spending in the Bible? Well, not much. Well, there you go. Amen? I really have not met anybody that spends a lot of time in God's Word that doesn't have a lot of faith. And 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 I've never met people with a lot of faith that don't spend time in God's Word. Amen? These two things go together. And so they need to trust the Word of God. So Joshua hears the Word of God, and he walks out to the two to three million people who could have said, you're not Moses. You're no Moses. Who are you to talk to us? Joshua goes out and speaks the Word of God with boldness. Not going to apologize for it. He's going to preach it. And I appreciate his heart. He's faithful. He's a man that God's going to use. When we're obedient, God is glorified and we get blessed. And Joshua, by faith, uh, still not fully understanding, delivered God's command to the priest. It made no sense. He trusted God anyway. He could have faith, faithlessly thought he was putting the ark into the harm's way. He could have said, oh man, if we put the ark out there and the water knocks it over, then what are we going to... No, God's word said. God commanded us. We're going to obey him. So Joshua is going to tell the people, look, it says in verse 10, and Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Gigasites and the Armorites and the Jebusites and the Termites and the flashlights and the, you know, whoever, right? <laughs> All the people in the land, no matter who they are, He says, you're going to know that I'm going to give you victory in that battle because you're going to see me move when you step into the river. Does God allow us to go through difficulty and then show up so that when then we know that when the greater difficulty comes, we can trust he's going to show up again? 
Amen? Again, a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And it's when we, when we see God show up in a smaller thing, it gives us faith in an even greater thing. But too often, people, their faith never grows because they never step in the river. Amen? They're over on the side. Dude, when you, build a, when, you build a, when you get a boat over here, I'll go. Build a, build a bridge or something, then you come back and talk to me. Until then, I'm camping out over here. We know that two and a half of the tribes of Israel decided to do that, right? Didn't enter into the land of promise. Why? Well, it's, just, it's easier here. It's easier here. Guys, obeying God is not always easy. Doing what is right is rarely easy, and doing what is easy is rarely right. Amen? But doing what is right and what is godly is always worth it. Joshua tells the people that by the miraculous work they're about to witness, it's going to serve as proof that God is with them and they can trust Him in the even greater trials that were about to take place. Point number six to more faithful walk is to humble ourselves before the Lord. Guys, we need to humble ourselves because if we think that we are something will cease to be desperate for God. And some of us in this room, might, and we all probably go through this at times, we get mad at God sometimes. Or we don't understand, or we get angry with God, and we wonder why God allows difficulty in our life. Let me tell you why He does. Because He loves you, and He wants to conform you more into the image of His Son, and He wants to keep you in a place where you have to be desperate for Him. We all have, all of us probably at some point in our life have dealt with that. Can we say amen to that? Well, we just don't understand, and we, we, we question God, and we go, well, God, why is this happening? Well, we all go through that at times, and we all are going, well, I don't understand. Guys, just remember that He loves you. Remember that He knows what's best for you, and He will even allow the difficult things in your life so you might become more like a son, and your faith will grow. Look, I was pastoring a church in Santa Cruz that I thought I was going to pastor for the rest of my life. God was blessing it. We had moved to a new facility. My kids were all walking with the Lord. It was the best time of my life spiritually. My family was blessed. I had a good job. Everything was wonderful. And out of seemingly out of nowhere, I have chest pains. We think it's a heart attack. I go to the doctor. It's not a heart attack. It's gallstones. It's going to be a minor surgery. Whoops, punctured bound pancreas, major septic, put you in a coma. And then from there, just all the things that came after that. And it would have been so easy to be mad at God. Why? Well, God, everything was so great. Why would you let that happen? And the reality is, the question's never, why God, but what God? It's not, why did you let this happen? But Lord, what do you want to teach me? How do you want to use this for your glory? Amen? Because I never doubted that God loves me. I know He does. I'm His son. He loves me. So if He allowed this to happen, it's because He loves me. Can we say amen? Well, here the children of Israel are. They're like, why are you putting us through this? Why do we have to cross this? Because I want you to learn to trust me. I want you to see the impossible. You know, the generation before got to see the Red Sea part. They're going to get to see the Jordan River part. Their parents saw the Red Sea part and were faithless. They're going to get to see the Jordan River part. And they're going to be called to be faithful. Guys, we don't get to see the power of God unless we're put into impossible circumstances first. I can't get out of this. I got no hope. I got no way. They're backed up against the Red Sea. Mountain on this side, mountain on that side. Egyptian army coming after them. Oh, no. Moses, hold up your staff. River parts. Now, the next generation, get in the water, walk across. Three million. Man, it's hard to get, you know, my grandchildren through Fantasyland at Disneyland. And there's four of them. You know, get, how do we get them across to the other? There's five of them now. How do we get, right? Can you imagine getting two to three million people across the river? What does that look like? How deep are they lining up? I mean, they're lining up for miles. Now, we trust God. It's going to happen. Let's go do this. Let's put our faith in the Lord. Let's humble ourselves. Let's believe in verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Isn't it good to know that God goes before you? Amen? I'm just walking behind Him. You know, I, I don't, you know... I think all men and women, to some degree, have some level of bravery. But I probably wouldn't step out in front of, you know, the uh, Philistine army with an 11-foot, 750-pound giant, uh, Goliath. 
and everybody else, their whole army stacked up behind him and go out there with a slingshot? Yeah, probably not. But if I know that God's going before me, I'll walk right behind him all day. How about you? Amen? Amen. You know, you're fighting Goliath. Yep, uh, by the way, I'm with him. Alpha and Omega created the universe, put stars in the sky. Created you, by the way. Amen? I'm hanging out with him. If I, you know, if you're with the Lord, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? In your own strength, you fail. And so, he says, look, we're going across. We're going to trust the Lord. By the way, the Lord's going in front of you. Oh, yay, God! Let me just walk behind you, Lord. You know, that's my prayer for my life. I hope it's a prayer for yours. I just want to walk right behind the Lord. Amen? Lord, wherever you lead, I'll, I'll go. You want to turn right or left where I didn't expect it? It's okay. I just want to follow you. I want, I want to be right behind you. I want to follow your glory. I want to keep my eyes on you. I don't want to trust in myself. I want to trust in you. So he lets them know the Lord is going before you. Look at verse 12. Now therefore, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. Now they finally get the plan. But it doesn't happen until they faithfully have lined up to go. They're stepping out in faith. They're going to trust God. And now that they're there, he says, as soon as you put your feet in the water, it's all going to stop. It's going to dry up. You're going to walk across on dry land. Oh, that sounds pretty good. I wish I'd known that before. No, you need to get here first. Amen? Now, that being said, they're still on the bank. The river's still rushing. And they've been told, when you put your feet in, it's going to stop. Really? Does that not sound kind of impossible? You know, with our God, all things are possible. Amen? And we need to come to a place where we trust God to do the impossible. But you know what? The Jordan River's not going to part till they put their feet in the water. Amen? And here's the problem with a lot of believers today, and it could be all of us. We never put our foot in the water so we never get to see the river part. We never step out in faith, so we never get to see God do great and awesome works. We sit back on the sidelines, satisfied with saved souls, but living wasted lives. And my prayer is that, guys, I want to go for it for God. Amen? I want to be in the center of His will. I want to, I mean, I got a vapor of time to be about it. Let's be about it for the kingdom of God. Let's not live in such a way that we're missing out. When all God has for us, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests, the impossible problems in their way are not seen as an oppressive trial, but as a glorious opportunity for God to work. See, here's the thing. When they looked at the river, they saw a trial. When God looks at it, He looks at an opportunity for them to show them His power. Amen? So when I look... You know, when I look at my circumstances of life, or you look at yours, all the difficult things we've been through, sometimes we look and we're overwhelmed by it. And we may think, oh man, this looks like a difficult obstacle. God says, no, no, no. That's how I'm going to show you my power and my glory and how much I love you. Amen? Amen. My most desperate prayer came during the time all three of my boys were addicted to drugs. Most of you guys know I had to do CPR on one of my sons in my kitchen, talking to 911, thinking I'm going to do his funeral. And by the grace of God, after several minutes of doing CPR, my son woke up. Went back to rehab, and two days later, bolted from rehab again. I laid in my floor in my bedroom and cried out to God with all my heart, please, Lord, protect him. Please, Lord, help me find him. You want to talk about a God thing? I don't know if you even know this story. I got in my car, and I knew my son was somewhere in south central Los Angeles. Is that kind of a big place to look? I get in my car, I drive down there, for some reason I get on the 10 freeway, I cut across, I get off a freeway off-ramp, praying, please Lord, help me find him, this seems impossible. I get off the off-ramp, when I get to the end of the off-ramp, who's standing there holding a sign asking for money? My son. There's only 11 million people in LA. God thing, amen? And when I pulled up, I looked at my son, I go, hey son, you know, amen? Get in the car, (laughs) amen? But the point is this, it's when we go through difficulty that it makes us desperate. And when we're desperate, that's when we're hanging on to God with both hands. Amen? 
You've heard me use a Psalm 23 analogy when we're laying down in green pastures. Where's the shepherd? He's around here somewhere. When you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you're hanging on to him with both hands and stepping one step behind him. And he's saying, look, I want you to follow me when I cross this difficult river. But I put this here. Did there even need to be a river there? But there is. Why? Because God wants to teach them to trust him. If they think it's an obstacle, he says, oh, no, no. It's an opportunity for me to show you my glory. I want you to see how great of a God I am. I want you to see that I'm on your side. I want you to see how powerful I am. Guys, if we're on the cruise ship to heaven and we never have any trials in life and there's never any difficulty and we're never treated unfairly and we never go through stuff and be, you know, guys, we never have to trust God. If the bank account's always full and the health's always perfect, we're never desperate for God. And so when we pray for people that are struggling, sometimes I pray, Lord, why did this all three of my sons? Do whatever it takes to get their attention. My oldest son was the one living on the street for four years, kept doing drugs and would not go to rehab. And I prayed every night, Lord, do whatever it takes. He got arrested. Thank you, Jesus, for getting arrested. Amen? Nothing better than county jail rehab. Tough. You're going. Amen? And praise God. Sober. Praise God. Lord, do whatever you got to do. Amen? And I don't want to just pray that for others. I want to pray that for me. Amen? Lord, do whatever you got to do. If I need to lose my job to have more... Okay. Lord, if I need to go through... Lord, it's okay. Because my ultimate desire is to be more like your son. And whatever that's going to take... Bring it. Amen? It's easy to pray that. But how you, are you still smiling when it comes? I prayed for it, but I didn't think it was going to be this bad. Amen? I, you guys know me. I've never... I was so straight edge in high school, everybody made fun of me. I played college football. I'd go to the football. I barely went to football. But when I went, I'd be drinking half and half because I was trying to gain weight all the time. Everybody's getting lit. I'm the straight edge guy in the room. I'm, I don't even know what it's like. I've never done a drug in my life, and I've got a drug ministry. How come? Because I love my boys. And God allowed it to do a work in me and to do a work in them. Amen? And when you go through trials, remember this. No suffering is wasted. Amen? When you go through difficulty, God's using that to prepare you to go from being a ministry to a minister. Amen? I tell my boys all the time, guys, I know when you're growing, when you cease to be a ministry, and you start taking what you've been through to minister to somebody else. Everybody in here, we've all been through difficulties and trials, and there are going to be people coming right behind us going through the same thing, and we can turn around and tell them how God delivered us and how He can deliver them. Amen? Well, here's what's happening. This generation, they're going to step in the water, and when they do, step in behind them, and here the priests are. He said, when we touch it, it's going to part. <coughs> They didn't just say, well, part first. <laughs> just open up a little bit. Give me a foot's worth or something. That's not what happened. They had to step out and trust God. Amen? Amen? Step out. Trust me. Watch what God will do. When you step in, then it will part. And again, the potential fear is what if it doesn't? What if the ark washes away? What if I make a fool of myself? The temptation would be, let me just stay here where it's safe. I'm good right here. I'm on the bank. It's safe here. Stay dry. Never into the land of promise. The choice for you and I is to step out in faith and see God work, experience God's highest, uh, enter into His promise, or remain on the banks. Stay where it's dry and comfortable. Miss out on God's highest and never experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I don't want to be just saved but as by fire. I want my life to count and impact people around me. Final point. So we saw words of faith. Begin your day with the Lord. Pursue God's presence. Hold the Lord in place of reverence and godly fear. Separate yourself from the world, none to the Lord. Trust God's word. Humble yourself. Glorify God. And finally, a walk of faith. So he's told them what they have to do. Are they going to do it? He's told us what we need to do. Are we going to do it? Look at these last four verses. Verse 14. So it was. When the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. So they must have lined up some distance away. 
They're all lined up, ready to go. And so the priests are leading the way, trusting that when they step in, the river's going to part. And the people behind him are, you know, they've got a distance in front of them, but they're at least moving in the right direction, hoping and trusting that when he steps in, the water's going to part, and they're going to follow in behind them. By the way, don't you love it when somebody around you has even more faith than you do? Because doesn't it cause you to be more faithful when you see someone else stepping out in faith? When someone else takes a chance for the kingdom of God, when someone else steps out, it makes you say, man, I want to be more like that. So they're walking behind the priest, right? And they're going, okay. I wonder if he's going to really step in. Let's see what happens. Verse 15. And those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water for the Jordan was overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. And the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at, Ad at Adam the city beside Zaraton. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Now here's what's interesting. When you look up this city where the water stopped, it's 19 miles upriver. So here's what I love about this. Did God know, not only know he was going to stop it, did he not only also know when they were going to step in? Because he stopped the waters 19 miles away to be perfectly timed to rush by and be done when they stepped in. So not, not only does God call us to step out, he knows when we're going to step out and if we're going to step out. Amen. And he's already preparing what's going to happen when we step out, before we step out. That's our God. Amen? I love this. They're, they're like, oh, I don't know. And they, you know he's, he's already stopped the water 19 miles away. It's all heaped up waiting, and they're going to step in. Love this picture. Last verse. Look what it says. Then the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on, what does that say? I, I, wait a minute. Have you ever put your feet in the bottom of a riverbed? Even if you move the water away, what would you have? Mud. Mud. Don't you love that he not only removes the water and has it stop, but he makes the ground dry so they can walk over on dry ground. That's called a supernatural God thing. Amen? Amen. You know, God leads us, and he doesn't just point us in the right direction, but he's doing the supernatural every step of the way. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Got a few minutes left. When we planted this church, you know, I pastored a church in Santa Cruz. I thought I'd be there the rest of my life. Went to high school there, grew up there. God was doing great things. Thought I'd be there the rest of my life. And then with the stuff going on with my boys, I realized I needed to go be their dad. So I stepped aside as pastor and spent two and a half years just ministering to my boys. And then I was waiting for for them to be in a good place, and then for my wife to feel ready to go plant another church. Because I knew the day I stepped down as pastor there, God was not done with me. And by the way, if God's given you a gift, He's not done with you either. Amen? And when it was time, I went and met with the pastors in, in uh, God Speak, and they said, pray about Moore Park or Calabasas. I've never been to Calabasas in my life. I've driven through Moore Park a few times. Went online, Moore Park had 27 churches, Calabasas had one. I said, I guess I'm going to Calabasas. I hadn't even driven over here. <laughs> then I go to a guy at work, I go, don't, don't, he go, where do you live? He goes, I live in Calabasas. I need to go look for a place for our church to meet. He goes, okay. Let's go look. We went to a couple schools, didn't work out. We walked in here. We are out in the parking lot, and I laid hands on him. I said, he got very nervous because he wasn't a very strong believer. And I said, well, let's just pray. We'll see if God wants us here. He'll show us. So we prayed. We walk in here. I said, hey, I'm thinking about planting a church. I'm going to be planting a church here in Calabasas. And uh, just wondering if you guys have rooms we could use and if you could accommodate us. We would need two rooms all the time. The lady says, yeah, you know, we'd love it. The other schools we went to would not give us classes for the children, so it wasn't going to work. She said, yeah, we'd love to have you here. I said, great. I said, where do you fellowship to the gal behind the counter? And I told him, I said, I want God to show us something supernatural to show this is where it's supposed to be. So where do you fellowship? She goes, well, you know, I, I don't really go to church. I said, great, well, there'll be a church here now, and you won't have far to go. <laughs> and then she said, uh, she said I, you know, I said, well, are you a believer? Do you follow? Well, I grew up in a Christian home, and I, I actually went to a Christian school when I was a kid, and uh, you've probably never heard of it. It's called Desert Christian School. It's out in Lancaster. I said, really? What years were you there? 
that she told me? I said, you know, I was a youth pastor at Calvary Chapel, Antelope Valley in Lancaster, and I was teaching you chapel when you were in high school uh, once a month, the entire time you were in high school. Is that a God thing or what? So then she says, you know, we're going to give you this. We were paying $68 a week to meet in one of the most expensive places in the city, the most expensive cities in the world, amen? It's called God thing. God didn't just say, okay, go to, Lanc- go to Calabasas and now figure it out. He's with you every step of the way. Amen? He's saying, look, you step out, I'm going to be with you every step. I'm going to dry up the ground in front of you. How about that? If you obey me, I'll show you the direction. Guys, if we step out in faith and trust God, He doesn't just point us in the right direction. He steps in front of us. He leads us. He guides us. He protects us. He watches over us. He loves us. Praise God. Amen? Any fruit that happens in this ministry or any ministry you're involved in, it's all to God's glory because God's the one who does it. We're just tools in the hands of the Master. Amen? Look what it says there at the end of that verse. On dry ground, in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. You could just read that. How long did it take three million people to walk a mile across a lake? It didn't happen in five minutes. And no doubt there might have been something, and that water's coming back. Let's, let's, let's move quickly. <laughs> Dude, they got across. They went in front of us. But the reality is, guys, God's timing is perfect. God's ways are perfect. They weren't stepping in a wading pool, but the rushing river of God's Holy Spirit. Now, here's what's interesting. In John chapter 7, it says this. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You know what else is interesting? As they're heading into the land of promise and going into the ministry God has for them, where did Jesus' public ministry begin? In the Jordan River. Amen? It was in the Jordan River where John the Baptist baptized Jesus when he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. His public ministry began in the Jordan River. And when does the ministry, or when does the power of God upon the children of Israel take place? When does the Spirit come upon them? When they head over the Jordan River. Nothing happens by chance in the Bible. These are 1,500 years apart, and it's the same place, because God's hand is upon them. God stopped the river in preparation for them to step over to the other side. So in closing, stepping out in faith, words of faith, instructions for a faithful walk. And I encourage all of us, take this with you, and if you don't have one, there's one on the back table. Begin your day with the Lord. Can I encourage you tomorrow morning, before you get your feet hit the ground, grab your Bible. Even if you spend 10 minutes in the Word and 10 minutes in prayer, start your day with the Lord. Secondly, pursue God's presence. Wake up in the morning seeking to know the Lord and pursue Him. Look for God's wisdom and direction. Hold the Lord in a place of reverence and godly fear. Don't curse His name, but praise His name. Amen? Honor Him. Bring glory to His name. Separate yourself from the world and unto the Lord. The world's going to tempt you all day, every day. Can we all say amen to that? He's going to try to draw you back into the old way of life. You guys know I do prison ministry on Monday nights. And you know, I I tell the guys, guys, you don't want to ever be wearing orange again. Amen? Because when you get out there, the enemy's going to be waiting for you. And there's all going to be tempted. And all of our temptations are, we're all tempted. All our temptations are different. Amen? And the enemy knows. So he's going to try to draw you away. Guys, separate yourself from the world. Trust God's word. You can't trust it if you don't read it, by the way. Amen? Read the book, don't wait for the movie. Humble yourself before the Lord, and then go to the place of not just trusting in God's Word, but showing it by our actions, putting feet to our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You, we praise You for Your Word, and we thank You, Lord, for the picture that we see in the children of Israel as they had a great obstacle in front of them but a greater God going before them. And Lord, no matter what the obstacles are in the life of everyone in this room, we trust, Lord, that you're greater than the obstacles. You're greater than the trials. You're greater than the temptation. You're greater than the the health issues, the financial issues, the difficulties of life. 
And Lord, we ask that as you go before us, that we would keep our eyes on you, that we would pursue you completely, that we would trust you alone. Lord, we love you. We praise you. You're a great and an awesome God. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to be the men and women of God you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and close the worship song. Is he worthy to be worshiped? Let's worship him.